invested in this green bond are waiting to see the, the impact of the projects that they invested in. This requires huge undertaking in terms of capacity in the different ministries. And we are advanced. So imagine other countries that are not at that level, that have not had uh, you know, their strategies put in place. You need a lot of investment in capacity building. So we have this, this, this space issue. Uh, we want, you know, everybody wants very quickly to go to the 1.5 or to make sure that we reach the 1.5, but there are realities on the ground which have to be addressed. But part of this is about assessing risk, and, and this is about government assessment of emerging market risk. This is about bank and credit divisions around the world assessing risk on the ground. Well, not only assessing it, you also need somebody that wants to carry that risk. Well, let's talk about that. Sorry, yeah, go ahead, and, and so here comes the idea of the concessional lending, right? Concessional, the, there's the concessional element that comes into blended finance so that you can de-risk uh, uh, the private sector money or the capital as it comes into countries. And that's what we need to work on. And that's where these pledges yeah. have to come and... and and that's where we need a framework where we say MDBs that are able to provide that concessional uh, uh, finance uh, are, uh, can do that. And we look for the bankable projects to be able to translate these, these, these uh, you know, targets have to be translated on the ground. They have to be. How, so we yeah. want to go beyond uh, uh, the numbers uh, uh, into what we see on the ground. And the final thing. Look at how many numbers were put around. The financing gap, it's a small one, it's a big one. There's another SDG yeah. gap by 2030. So there are many gaps that are out there. We need to have a, a, a clear data uh, okay. you know, quantification. But I want to pursue further the idea. You said, well, who has to carry that risk? This morning, Stephanie Flanders was with me just on the television a short time ago, and she said one of, one of the, the nuances that came out from the discussion this morning is about more government in a variety of ways in a post-pandemic yes. world. Yes. That's what we've learned. So the question is this then, um, is big government, DM government, G20 government, whatever, whatever G you'd like to choose, doing enough to carry the risk? Is it government responsibility or is it bank responsibility? Well, it's a combination, but, but to answer your first question, no, I don't think governments are doing enough. Uh, I think definitely uh, there are a, a huge potential to make a real difference if you take some of the money that countries are now actually deciding in, uh, to spend in, in, in climate aid yes. and use them maybe not only to subsidize you know, establishing uh, offshore wind or whatever, but also looking at the financial models. Well, I think that we've maybe looked at this in the way that you would look at development policy in the past and not recognizing that this is a, a totally different type of policy and what you need might be a little bit different from what you've done in, in, in previous years. Okay, let me fly a kite then. Who's got the power to change this narrative, really to change this narrative from blah, blah, blah uh, to, to, to rob somebody else, uh, to actually change it from that to a deployment of capital that bears the risk. Is it China and the United States of America? I know that there's an incremental move forward here. Mm. Is it up to them? Are they the power brokers to shift the risk element? You're, 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 you're nodding your head. I, I'm just saying that it's everybody's response. Everybody yeah. has a role to play. So but I'm just looking for who can ignite that backstop more. I think, more I think COP26 started it. And I think, the, you know, remember uh, it was two years until Glasgow. So there yeah. was, and there, there was a pandemic. Today, we only have 12 months to Sharm el Sheikh. Uh, you know, what, what was discussed is still fresh and we need to maybe you know, push forward as much as possible. But everyone has a role. Okay. But yeah. it's just important to, to underline that this is not something that rich countries should do because they are idealists and to help poorer countries, not only at least. Primarily it's, it's because it's also going to be very good business. I mean, a lot of renewables, take offshore wind as an example, can actually now compete with coal in price most places on the planet. And if you look into a future where India, for instance, they have now pledged that they will establish 500 gigawatt of renewables before 2030. Today they have zero gigawatt of offshore wind. So there's a huge potential and it's a business model for many countries, my own certainly, but I would I would assume many countries are looking into this right now. The other theme we, we, we managed to snatch just a few minutes, all of us uh, here and there through this morning, was monitoring. 
Um, so, Dan, let me come to you on that. Uh, many pledges, much ambition. The United Nations has limited capacity to chastise people who do not hit their targets, who do not deliver on their, on their pledges. Um, how important is a more robust monitoring framework? Where does that come from? Who does that? Who should take responsibility for that? Well, I do actually think that that's one of the areas where some progress was made. Uh, new rules on transparency and monitoring, which uh, most experts actually said nice, nice things about, so that's a step forward. Also, if you look at the market-based instruments, the carbon market, what's called the Article 6 in the negotiations, there we, we have now established new rules that will secure environmental integrity, for instance, in the sense that we will avoid double accounting things like that. But, but there is an underlying problem to all of this, which is that mm, the COP process in the United Nations doesn't make legally binding regulation in the countries that have signed the treaty. That, that, that's simply not possible. We don't have, a, we don't have a, a way of sanctioning countries that doesn't fulfill the criteria. Having said that, if there wasn't any consequences of breaking the rules, then I don't think we would have as fierce negotiations as we have. The reason why countries are really engaged in this and why it matters is that there is uh, naming and shaming and countries are watching each other and I, I don't think you'll get away with pledging something and then don't delivering on it. Dr. Um, I just want to say that in terms of you know uh, sanctions I mean the, the, the whole principle in Paris uh, agreement is shared but differentiated responsibility right and the and and therefore uh, it is you know on every country to decide given it's the Development. But something else is happening. We have ESG, which is coming up. We have, uh, under Mark Carney, many stress tests for banks based on how much uh, they do when it comes to green projects. Mm. So there is already a momentum when it comes to the green recovery, when it comes to a private sector looking for yes. uh, green pro projects that generate money renewables. We had a deficit in electricity. They were exporting electricity because we were able to uh, create many solar projects and actually uh, the, the energy strategy that I was talking about. So I think that uh, it's not about sanctions. It's about, I think, a, a global movement towards climate action. Everybody's more aware. The amount of times the word green comes up in conversations, whether it's policy, whether it's national goals, national strategies today have to include green. Otherwise, you won't be able to draw investments, you won't be able to finance your deficit, and you won't be able to uh, you know, show your commitment to this international uh, uh, movement towards climate action. With one and a half, 120 left, so I'm going to squeeze two in. Um, to you, Dan, question from the audience very quickly. Why don't regulators and countries underwrite the first losses in green financing, in EMs? Is that, is, that, is that something? And why don't regulators and countries, sovereigns, underwrite the first losses in green financing in emerging markets with a sub-investment grade rating? Is that, is that a kite that could be considered to fly? Well, I think the question is, why don't they? Mm -hmm. that, well, that's difficult for me to answer why, why, why different countries don't. But I think uh, probably that, that is uh, a, a way forward. And I, I would assume that that's definitely for, for our, my own country and in many European countries, that, is, that are some of the possibilities that we're looking into. I think that probably one of the reasons it hasn't happened before is coming back to what I said earlier, that we are still thinking about climate aid as we would traditionally look at development aid. So we need to progress our thinking. Dr. Rania, you have 20 seconds, top of the agenda, on the way to Sharm el-Sheikh. Yeah, Sharm el-Sheikh is going to be very important for us, but it's on, on the climate aid. I just want to say that uh, Egypt provides a very significant example when it comes to development finance, ODA. Uh, we have uh, a portfolio of more and $30 billion, 50% uh, of that contributes to SDG number 13 mm -hmm. uh, with mitigation and adaptation projects. And there is a lot that we can do when it comes to South-South cooperation. Sharm el-Sheikh is a cop for Africa, and therefore we say United Africa for a resilient future. And there's plenty that we are going to be discussing in the next 12 months to try and create an integrated global framework for this financing. We need to have MDBs in there. We need to, to find innovative ways okay to accelerate the blended and to accelerate the de-risking. I hope many in the audience are there. I hope I'm part of that conversation alongside you in preparedness for that event next year. Dan Jürgensen, Minister of Climate and Energy and Utilities for Denmark, thank you very much. Thank Dr. You. Rania Amishat, Minister of International Cooperation for Egypt, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you. you.
Please welcome our moderator, Manus Prani, and his panelists, Mayor of Freetown, Sierra Leone, Yvonne Akisoya, Minister of Finance and Economic Planning of Rwanda, Dr. Uzo Najijimana, Vice President, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific at the Asian Development Bank, Ahmed M. Syed, and founder of TIG Africa and CEO of Downforce Technologies, Josephine Wapakabula. And I think we might be joined as well virtually. Yes, we have Yvonne Akisoya, the, the mayor of Freetown. Yvonne, welcome uh, virtually uh, to the gathering. The rest of your, your panel are here in front of us. So a warm welcome to you all. We've just been discussing the emerging market, developing market, who needs to do more, how do we meet in the middle. But your panel is about the equality uh, and a just road, let's say, to, to finance. And this is where I want to start off. When I caught up with, uh, with Josephine, it was a, a wonderful line. It reminds me a great deal at home in Ireland, which is other people have a great time at the bar and in the restaurant. Then they leave, and they leave you with the bill, quite literally. So Dr. J, let's, let's kick it off there. Post-COP26, your assessment is the DM checked out, but they left EM with the bill. Was it that bad? I wouldn't say it was that bad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just to, um, uh, to kind of paraphrase the saying in Uganda, one of the tribes say, if you're last to the bar, make sure you're not left with the bill. And um, it, it, you know, from emerging and developing economies, it can feel that way at times that there's a disproportionate sort of spread of who, who bears the cost. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, thinking more positively, if we look at this more as an opportunity um, to see how can the funding and financing in the renewable energy biodiversity space actually benefit developing and emerging economies, I think it's a more fruitful conversation. Were there some headlines um, out of COP? Yes. I think now the devil is in the detail yep. and how we're going to practically make that work. Well, part of the narrative is about the funding gap. It's the one pervasive thing that has come up time and time again in each of the conversations with Dr. Rania before you, uh, along with, with Dan Jurgensen. The funding gap, now no pressure on the development bank to fill that gap, but there's a great debate. What is, quantify for me your understanding of the funding gap, and do you as a development bank need to change some of your lending practices and your credit criteria to help close the funding gap? Well, I think um, you know, there's a lot of talk about this $100 billion number. Yes. Um, and everybody says, well, well you know, show me the money. Uh, and, and I'd say a couple of things about that number at the outset. Um, the first is that we kind of made it up. You know, it's not grounded in any fundamental analysis. Actually, if we look at you know, more, more fundamental work, the IEA says we need a trillion and a half dollars of infrastructure investment in sustainable finance by 2030. So actually, the need is much larger, number one. Number two, uh, when we talk about this amount of money, we're actually not talking about outcomes. There's a lot of risk when you talk about mobilize X amount of money that you actually don't achieve the goal that you need. And the third thing I'd say about this number, uh, which I think, I really do think a fixation on it can be, can be misleading, is that it inherently assumes that what we're going through is a burden sharing exercise. Mm. That um, in fact, there's a cost to be shared, and that was the model of climate transition, when we thought most of these technologies were not um, NPV positive. But we now know that actually almost every core net zero technology will ultimately get to the point where it's commercially viable. And so I think there's a real need to change the conversation from one of burden sharing uh, to one of opportunity seizing. And I think that we're gonna find in the years ahead that decarbonization is development, that the countries that position themselves along this immense river of capital and skills and technology that is going to flow. These countries are going to attract FDI. They're going to build manufacturing bases. They're going to generate high quality jobs. Um, and happy to come to the ADB's role in a minute. I'm not trying to dodge that question, but. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> Go on. Uh, let's talk about Rwanda. What do you need? I mean, um, the. The, the theory is uh, a speculative number that was made up. Tell me what you really need uh, to, to make this equality uh, and this transition. Uh, Rwanda has costed its, its, uh, its strategy up to 2030. 
Mm -hmm. The total needs is about uh, 11 billion US dollars. Distributed across key sectors uh, of mitigation and uh, adaptation to climate change. The biggest part is uh, smart and uh, resilient agriculture. Uh, the other one is uh, sustainable transport mm -hmm. systems. So if we continue to uh, uh, waste management, water and sanitation, uh, and, and so on. So the total from 2020 to 2030 is 11 billion US dollars. Okay, so that, that's the reality of money. money. The mayor of uh, Freetown in Sierra Leone, Yvonne, thank you very much, first of all, for making time to be with us on a virtual basis. You're dealing with your own uh, crisis. We wish you well uh, with, with the natural disaster that you, that you have in Sierra Leone. So our thoughts are with you on, on that side. So uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear uh, the, you know, Ahmed say, actually, let's get real, they, they, they sort of uh, came up with a, a finger in the air in terms of the $100 billion number. You're the mayor of Freetown in Sierra Leone. You hear a great deal talked about in a cold and wet Glasgow. What do you need on the ground to make a just transition? Tell this audience what you really need. Thanks so much, Manis, and good morning, everyone. I think um, moving from the rhetoric to the reality, um, actually having the access to the finance. And yes, I've heard this a number of times. That was a finger, uh, you know, sort of finger in the air, um, a number plucked from nowhere. Uh, but wh whether it was from plucked from nowhere or it was calculated that there is a need for investment. Two things that were said just from previous speakers, which I just want to land on. Mm -hmm. One is the importance of looking at the outcomes. So I do agree entirely that this is not about just saying we're looking for numbers. Um, and secondly, that this is about development, uh, which creates opportunities. Now, we've spoken, we've heard a lot from sovereigns, and that's the way COP works, that's the way the UN system works and the international organizations. But something has to change, it's beginning to, but we have a ways to go, and that is a recognition of the role of cities. Fundamentally, the work that needs to be done in mitigation and adaptation set by national government policies, yes, um, worked on in collaboration with national governments, still needs to be delivered at community level, still needs to be delivered with people. Uh, and perhaps one of the things that we've got to be very, very clear about, particularly on our continent, is that space being given for cities, which is sometimes closed in terms of accessing the finance, but also in terms of political engagement. So cities are for you, but then I take it back to Josephine. And of course, when you and I caught up, you said, Manus, we need to focus very clearly. We can talk a great deal about the technology that helps us on this transition, and that's laudable and applaudable, but you say it is about the natural capital assets. Expand your vision of what natural capital assets are and why they are so critical to this, this journey. Um, yeah, and I'll tie that back to something Ahmed said about, you know, getting access to the financing. So there's challenges, even when you have structured very good um, opportunities, often the criteria by which we are measured to access the financing financing, whether it's credit or risk ratings, are very sort of developed economy driven. So you can have challenges getting access to that financing. And once you do get access, what I'm seeing in the sort of companies and projects I'm involved in is there's a heavy focus on renewable energy, which is important. We need to transition um, effectively to different energy sources. We need strong technology. We need battery storage technology. But something that's sort of been a personal journey for me as well is the other side, which is natural capital assets. It's land, it's farming, it's biodiversity, it's regenerative agriculture. And finding ways to ensure investment goes into that part of the narrative, which is addressing our net zero carbon goals, but also our biodiversity net gain, which is just as critical. And so I feel that, you know, on this concept of opportunity, let's see the opportunity not just in renewable energy, but also in these natural nature-based solutions in ensuring we address this issue. And is that about building, I mean, can I just ask you in terms of the lending and the lending practices and perhaps building on those of what you've traditionally done. That's what came out from the last panel, which is we're looking at 
the same problem, the old problem, but we need to progress our thinking in, in how we deal with it. That came from the Danish minister and from Rania al as, as Fundamentally, as a banker, um, what, what do you need to change? What way do you, I'm, I'm not telling you to change, but um, I get the sense that a lot of other people probably are asking the bankers to change their thinking. Your response? Yeah, I mean, so as you know, we're getting calls. Um, our institutions are being called laggards by all sorts of powerful people. And um, I think that uh, that's a reflection of uh, the pace and scale of the challenge ahead of us. And people look around and they say, well, where are the intermediaries that can support um, capital in developing countries? And I think the development banks are uniquely positioned there. Um, but I think we, the next sort of question is, like, what are our unique assets? Um, and, and balance sheet is, is one, and I want to come in a moment to how we use it. But when we have that conversation, we sometimes forget that actually our most powerful asset as development finance institutions is the, the knowledge and relationships we have on the ground. You know, I have 50 people who work for me in Jakarta. We've been working on the Indonesian energy sector for 50 years. So that relationship set, which until now at the World Bank, at the ADB, at the African Development Bank, has largely been inward looking and been used for our own projects, actually needs to start to get aligned with the large ecosystem of private sector actors, philanthropies who are interested in our agenda. And I think even before we get to the point of what more we can do in terms of risk capital, yeah. there's enormous opportunity in, 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 in high impact partnership. And so at ADB, just in the last two months, uh, we announced a climate innovation fund funded by Bloomberg and Goldman Sachs. We announced a new sustainable finance infrastructure platform funded by Tomasek and by HSBC. And we, have, we announced a blended finance platform to acquire and early retire coal-fired power assets. In all of those cases, actually it's zero dollars from ADB in terms of balance sheet capital. Everybody needs our relationships to get things done. And so I think there's enormous opportunity from impact by leveraging this unique asset that sits inside the development finance institutions that's largely been used for our own purposes. So that, that would be point one. Point two on the balance sheet side, um, there's a lot of people who say, um, you know, you underwrite risk wrong. You need to actually um, de-risk the private sector. Um, I think that's a fair point and we should think it through, but I'd make a slightly different point, mm -hmm. which is that what's stopping us from doing more infrastructure investment in emerging markets and frontier markets is actually not the lack of capital. Um, it's not the binding constraint. We're on the biggest risk on uh, environment for EM that's been seen in a long, long time. We're 15 years into quantitative easing. Like cost of capital is not the issue in the world, right? The issue in these environments tends to be skills. People don't know how to develop pipeline. Um, it tends to be uh, political economy. But I think the most important thing is the thing that you were talking about. When you were talking about, you know, I have investment opportunities in my country, but you know, a private equity fund with 10-year money shows up, and that's just not the structure here. We've got scale capital globally that's designed around a series of corporate and tax considerations in developed markets. It's not fit for purpose yeah. in emerging markets. And I think one of the things that institutions like ours can do is actually try to make sure that you know, there's all this money, but it's not flowing where it needs to go, in large part, in part, because the market vehicles are not designed for the right purpose. If you want to do an infrastructure project in an emerging market country, and you want to do it from first idea to shovel in the ground, that's 10 years. Who's going to do that? Not a large you know, developed country corporate and not an infrastructure fund. And there's all these examples of these crevices, which are very large, and the money's sloshing around, but it's not getting there because there's these market structure mismatches. Okay, Yvonne, you're nodding, and, and uh, of course, Dr. Uziel, um, you have a, a big ambition. So let's just get a couple of responses to, to what you've just said, uh, Ahmed, in, in terms of um, the gap. It's a gap between perhaps uh, the capital uh, and, and deploying on the ground. Yvonne, you've just listened to Ahmed talk about that gap. In other words, it's credibility, how things are presented, how they're put forward to the development banks, et cetera. Um, you're nodding, but what are you agreeing with or, or what is it that you concur with in that narrative from Ahmed? That mismatch um, in terms of the, the structure of the financing and the, the, the ability to access it because of the returns, because of the time frames that um, you know, the private sector infrastructure funds are looking for. So um, let me use an example of, of our transport um, a bit ambition. So, so in Transform Freetown, our foundation is climate. Across 11 sectors, we have 19 targets. 
we're looking at a climate action plan which focuses on sanitation, transportation, also brings in um, nature-based solutions. We're planting a million trees. Transportation. 33% of our very minute greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation. We have a proliferation of low um, capacity, high emitting, very old vehicles because of government policy. Coming to that point again, a policy which encourages um, the importation of old vehicles because taxation is lower for old vehicles. As a city, this is a government policy. As a city, we have spent two and a half years, and we actually don't have your typical problem of low skills base. We actually have a really strong project team mm -hmm. and have put together an excellent proposal for a cable car, um, a cable car system. We've worked with Medellin, we've worked with um, cable car manufacturers, we've worked with other stakeholders, but accessing even feasibility We've paid for the pre-feasibility. Full feasibility, it's taken us two years. We finally now have two applications in, one to the Green, green Climate Fund and one to um, C40 Cities because of our membership of that. But we, when we talk about speed, so Amit's point, from concept to shovel in the ground 10 years, this has got to change. And for that to change, we need to see more of that, not just the blended finance, because we do have the, we do have ADB in this mix, but it's the speed of response. You know, that, that when, when we just, just oppose the urgency of climate um, innovations, climate interventions against the typical um, cycle of accessing development funding, the two do not mix, the two do not align because we are talking about a climate emergency. No one's saying shortcut um, and don't get do it right, don't ensure you've got the viability, don't ensure you've got your numbers correct. Mm -hmm. But we cannot continue to work at this pace, nor can we continue um, to have the structures that are expecting private sector money to come in. And where the, in, in, where the um, inter, in, uh, institutions are coming in, they need to move more fast, more quickly. Dr. Uziel, you, you, you gave a figure to the audience, we need $11 billion, you have projects ready. Um, when you listen to Yvonne saying the system has got to change, what is the biggest mm -hmm. and most substantial obstacle for you as the finance minister of Rwanda to funding this transition? Are you suffering from, I mean, Yvonne runs free time in Sierra Leone, you're the finance minister of Rwanda, so scale up the, the challenge for, for the audience in terms of what is the toughest part for you? I think the first step is to have the, the plans in place, which are costed, which, which give indication on the priority of the country. Number two is to have a pipeline of projects. And this is where many countries uh, have problems. The capacity to develop projects that an investor can come and say, oh, I'm interested. So if we have a pipeline project, at least a pre feasibility studies. Then but it's also about the integrity of those projects yes, and the credibility of those projects. Which one are profitable? It can attract private sector. Which ones can could attract private sector? But upon uh, providing some uh, de risking instruments, this is the, so the issue that was raised. And uh, I think that uh, they committed the funds for climate change, some of them could be used to, uh, to de-risk some, uh, some uh, investment so that private can comfortably invest in some of the solutions, such as infrastructure, urban mobility, uh, and the others. And de-risk in a lot of these projects is one thing that came through in, in, the, pre in the previous panel. Where are you on green bonds? Are, are you going to issue green bonds in Rwanda? So we, we have just started the preparation. We have never uh, issued a, a, a green bond, but our uh, development bank is already uh, in early stage of preparation for the issuance of our first uh, green bond. They get we hope to be successful. Uh, okay, a any timing on that? Uh, next year, 2022? Probably. Probably. Uh, but Ahmed, let's bring it to you. I mean, green bonds, I mean, a lot of people write headlines and news articles as these are the, you know, the, the damnest moment for financing. Um, are they? Are green bonds a, a, a 
key component part of this journey, of this progress for finance. I mean, they have the potential to be, but the other bonds better not be getting a little more gray at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> right, so uh, you know we've got to make sure that when we measure things, that we measure them at the at the level that is relevant. Um, and if we're not measuring them at the level that's relevant, we're just relabeling things. Uh, and so I think the big challenge for the green bond market, which is a, which is a good movement, an important movement, um, is the integrity of the certification process. And if your underlying um, revenue stream or business is unchanged, it's just almost like tranching securities, right? You created a triple A tranche, but then, you know, the bottom of the capital stack got riskier. Well, the same thing can happen in sustainability. And so the important thing is to make sure that that's not happening. If, if it's not happening, then it's a great movement. And Yvonne, in terms of, we, we've debated on the previous panel and on this panel uh, about the size of the funding gap. We've already established that, you know, it was uh, perhaps an arbitrary number. Give me a sense of what you see as the funding gap um, and how does that get how does that get closed or how does that best get closed in your opinion was that to Yvonne or myself that sorry that was to, my apologies I'm, I'm, I'm saying Yvonne I'm looking at Josephine yeah. my apologies Josephine um, excuse me look apologies Yvonne you know it, it may be an arbitrary number but it's a number that people do band about um, and one of the, I think, opportunities we have is to better qualify what is funding actually going to these, whether you call it climate change initiatives, mm -hmm. or what is, what, is, what is the criteria by which we define that? Because that varies. Is it government pledges? Is it grants? Is it loans? Is it private sector loans? Is it public sector loans? Depending on which report you read, that number can vary which then has the knock-on effect of making it difficult to verify and measure where it's actually had impact. So I think if we improve the system of at least defining what categorizes you know, funding that's committed to developing and emerging economies to support them in this journey, which we all need to be in collectively, and then finding more consistent ways of measuring that and bringing data around the impact and ways to show progress, I think we're making steps in the right change, and that will require private sector, public sector, governments, banks actually coming together and having consistent ways of looking at this. I mean, the ongoing joke on what does net zero mean? Can't, you know, there's all these phrases we use in this sector where when you actually get into the detail, we're not necessarily talking about the same things. So I think whatever the number is, the process and the steps by which we validate that money has gone to initiatives addressing the issues of net zero or biodiversity gain, allowing us to measure that and have a consistent way of progressing is going to be key. Because right now, um, I see a lot of, so depending on which report you, you read, it's going quite well or it's, you know, nothing has been spent at all. So we, we need to find some consistency. And Yvonne, if I bring it to you, which is that, that data, in other words, show and tell, isn't it? In other words, I've got this project, here's the data, it's robust, it has integrity. Um, and that's critically important in terms of convincing the banker or the financer, whether it's, whether it's state or, or, or development bank, it's the integrity of the data that you present, isn't it? Yes, but um, I think there's also um, a piece that I want to bring, bring back. When I, I listen to all the speakers, and understandably, very little is said about cities um, and cities being able to act financing. Um, I'm not sure if the ADB in Asia is different, but certainly the ADB in Africa, you work through the central, you work through governments. Um, and that's true of many other institutions. This is, this could potentially, and in fact, is already a, a, an additional step, an additional hurdle. And when we talk about the need for time, um, time being of the essence, it's one we really want to begin to address. If you've got that, we've got to look at the structure of our financing institutions, the finance framework. C40 cities alone account for 700 million people. Um, and by 2050, it's estimated that 70% of the population of the world will be living in cities. Can I just put to the floor, what, how is it that we are looking at access to finance for cities? So and I'll come back to your question, Manas. Um, the challenges that we're facing uh, and, and being able to, to access this funding from the perspective of a emerging market is, is a, it's, a, it's one which 
is integral to now the survival of people. Uh, um, in everything that we've discussed, We've really looked at, talked about the gap, but I want to just draw it back for a second, not just to cities, mm -hmm. but to people. I want to just remind us that there's, we've got a situation now where climate impacts, the, the weather, the changes to the, the flooding, the landslides, there's an urgency which requires matched funding. That's not coming through. Um, and it's not just about that number it's also about the structure of financing and it's also about policy so for, if i could just quickly land yes. on this um we have a situation where we uh, in the previous panel it was acknowledged we've all acknowledged that there's no one really holding governments to account there's no system to say you must but beyond that where policies are made or policies are not made um which, which are going against the climate ambition, and you have cities trying to move in the opposite direction. Who is being the sheriff here? Where, where are we seeing that support to ensure that agendas within at the subnational level are given the opportunity to emerge in order for climate ambition to be supported? Um, that's something which we're not talking about enough, and I will and be doing my job properly if I didn't bring that to this discussion. Well, certainly the last panel um, came up with, uh, well, touched on that, which is, you know, the United Nations, they don't have the teeth to sanction in regards to climate. So let's just expand on that a little bit. Um, Josephine, uh, how, how can we, I suppose, assess that everybody's doing their part on banking, on government, on multilateral, uh, on development agencies, etc. What would you like to see, let's say, over the next couple of years in terms of better governance, of commitments? I think the Danish minister said to me, Manus, don't worry. There's plenty of people out there with name and shame people that are not meeting their commitments. But give me your thoughts. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question. It's an excellent point raised by, by Mayor Ekisoya. Um, but, you know, my experience has been that the practicalities of that, yeah. of getting all the parties around the table. And all the relevant, it's more the relevant parties around the table. So, you know, we have COP26, heads of state, big policy makers, we have business, you have advocates. But to the mayor's point, when you get that down to a city level within an economy on the African continent, how do those messages trickle down to something practical? How does, how does that financing trickle down to something practical? How does that relate to local policy, local governance, local government initiatives? Um, and so, you know, my personal view and it's why I heavily involved in the private sector, mm -hmm. um, really being a driver for some of the scale initiatives, um, because I think sometimes government does have challenges or, you know, policymakers where, you know, policy may not move as quickly as always liked. I think the private sector has a lot of opportunity in terms of driving this agenda, trying to package projects um, and get data around initiatives to attract financing at scale and at pace. Um, but we need all parties around the table, and I don't have the answer on how you get all those parties around the table. Um, I think it can happen at a sort of very top level a sort of statement policy level but practicality on getting everyone around the table I, I i don't have the answer yet on that well let's take it to the minute minister of finance we'll, we'll come back to the bank in at banker in a moment but we'll take it to the minister of finance because i think it's interesting as you say a great deal of global ambition global commitment and you know significant movement with the us and with china etc um for a minister of finance you've heard a lot of the rhetoric what do you need to see happen now in the next two to three years, even on the road to Sharm el What do you want to see actually happen that would make progress on equality and climate for Rwanda? Uh, I think we have the foundations in place. We have uh, our national uh, green fund, which uh, has been operational since 2013. Mm -hmm. and it has mobilized over $200 million for green investments and uh, in the form of Credit with line through uh, our Devel development bank, through grants to innovations, and uh, also uh, to other uh, uh, investment in uh, climate mitigation adaptation. 
So what we need is to scale up its capacity to mobilize more, more resources from international funds. Number two is to really to have, a, at, at the global level, to have a, a robust monitoring evaluation mechanism that we show the progress every year. So what does that look like? Give, just, just, just define for me just briefly, what does a robust mechanism for international assessment look like? Just help me take that off the page. Like now, COP26 has made commitments. We need to see after six months, after one year, where we are. But in, in our own countries, we need also a mechanism to, really to, to inform all, all players about the available opportunities. Okay. Sometimes there is a, a communication gap as well. Even what is available may not be used in, in, in some cases. So the institutional framework we need to have domestically, then also the globally we need to have mechanisms that can really monitor the progress uh, periodically to see how the commitments are being, being uh, fulfilled. Dr. Uziel, quarterly reporting is the fear that in every CEO's heart that I meet. <laughs> Um, Ahmed, let, let me bring it to you. Um, I, I'm quite drawn by this whole concept of, of what have you done, what have you achieved? Um, it's not for me to arbitrate whether the UN should have sanctions, capacity over climate. What do you want to see in terms of uh, assessing progress and understanding the world that you're, de that you're deploying capital to? Yeah, so I, I'll make two comments. I mean, I think um, we already have a self-monitoring system at the national level. Countries make commitments, yes. they get measured against it. Um, I think once you start to come down from that level, uh, there's a real risk of, um, you know, the I'm a good person problem. You know, that, that various actors, you know, have a range of intentions from outcome oriented to avoiding uh, reputational harm. Um, and therefore, what they invest in is a narrative, a narrative that says, I'm a good actor. The classic example for me is uh, a, a power company that operates coal-fired power, sells it to somebody who's going to keep operating it um, for the next 30 years and says, look at me, I'm cleaner. Well, you're cleaner, but the world isn't. And so I think that um, at that level, uh, there's a few forces that can drive a little bit greater, um, greater um, scrutiny of what's happening. One is we have a very, very active group of citizens around the world on these issues, and I don't think they're letting institutions and people get away with things anymore. And I think that voice is extraordinarily important, number one. And ultimately, that expresses itself through the political process. And number two, um, you know, at the end of the day, you can only seek refuge and process so much. Uh, you have to look at the person in the mirror. And individual responsibility um, on, on these sorts of questions matters. Uh, and there's no way to get around it. Um, you, can't, you can't police your way to morality. You can only police yourself to legality, right? Um, and so I do think at the individual level, every leader of a company, every person, um, they also have to take responsibility, but not for these intermediary measures of success. Not how much money, right, but for outcomes. Um, and I think that that is a force that operates not just at the procedural or legal level, but at the personal and moral level. Let's just get a couple of quick closing thoughts, Josephine, fr from you. If I meet you in Sharm El Sheikh in a year's time, what's the benchmark of progress for your world? Um, it goes back to what I said, that we see progress not on just the renewable energy technology side, but this whole concept of natural capital assets biodiversity net gain, um, mm -hmm. what we're doing around regenerative agriculture and, and other farming methods to sequester carbon and yeah, so I, I would love to see progress on both fronts and the conversation in step on both fronts, which I believe are equally important in this. Yvonne, I can only bring it back to you as the mayor of free time, which is I presume you want to have some good conversations with architects, builders and, uh, and, and, and the, the people that create the infrastructure that can build the cities that can help you. Who do you want to have the most conversations with in the next year, uh, Yvonne? Actually, I'm, I'm actually more interested in policy. Um, we have a situation, Joseph just, just talked about uh, um, nature-based solutions. We're planting a million trees. Um, but at the same time, land use planning and building permits, uh, those powers are not devolved to the local government as they should be, as the Act provides. They're held by the central government. So we, we, we work at a risk that investments in um, biodiversity, in green solutions, and in green jobs 
could be reversed by the issuing of land for construction. So I think this piece around the diverse political economies um, that exist on our continent is one that needs to be looked at. We can't detract uh, um, the reality from the conversations. We can't speak in these general terms without understanding that there is always a risk or there is a significant risk that policy narrative is not matched by actions on the ground. So that would be my biggest concern for us to really look hard at how we are measuring that success, but not just at that high level, coming down to the okay. national and ensuring that we have a coalition of the willing that is supported. I get, I get the sense that 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 your your ministers of government fear the fear the mayor of Freetown <laughs> when she strides into government buildings with a with a new agenda. Uh, we wish you well uh, with the current crisis that you're handling, Yvonne Aki Soya, the mayor of Freetown in Sierra Leone, and my panelists here. Uh, and everybody enjoy the rest of the new economy forum. I think it's a good conversation. Benchmarks and responsibility. Ahmed Saeed, vice president for East Asia, South Asia, and Pacific at the Asia Development Bank, uh, Josephine uh, Wapa Kabula, uh, CEO of uh, Downforce Technologies, and Dr. Uziel, Minister of Finance for Economic and Planning in Rwanda. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your time at the New Economy Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome our moderator, Bloomberg New Energy Finance Chief Content Officer, Nathaniel Bullard, and his panelists, President of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, Jimmy Chun, CEO of Sweet Bank Roba, Liza Johnson, founding and managing partner of Inclusive Capital Partners, Lynn Forrester de Rothschild, and CEO and Executive Director of Tomasic Holdings, Dylan Pillay Sanderson. For the first time all day, my glasses are not fogged up. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to our session today. You may have noticed that we have a few sessions about climate on the agenda. By my count, we have six of them today, one way or another, in the plenary. And if we think about the word climate and how it has appeared in discussion, it has been in, as far as I can tell, every single session that has happened on the main stage. It has come up. So there may be something there, shall we say. There may be something that we need to talk about. But I think a useful thing to do before we dig in further, and we're going to be looking specifically at the finance aspect of this, is to do a polling question. So get your phones out, everyone. Get ready. I'm going to ask a question, which we're going to then mull over as a group here, and then we'll get the responses out. Could I have the polling question, please? So, how much of climate finance actually translates into greenwashing? This is a bit provocational, but that's on purpose. Is it the majority of the finance that we've been talking about of late? Is it too much of it, but still we're making substantive difference? Or not at all? Are the majority of firms that we're talking to when we talk about climate actually taking real action? So, take a moment answer that question. 
And then I, in turn, am going to sort of work my way through the discussion up here. Liza, I'm going to start with you. So I want to sort of get a sense of the state of play. Like, what would you say is the state of climate finance right now? We've got quite a lot of commitment needed to be done to reach the sort of global targets that have come out of COP21 in Paris, COP26, just this last month. What is our state of play in making a green transition, if there is indeed one happening? Uh, there's absolutely one happening. I think we've got a good framework in the Glasgow Pact, but uh, now it's up to us, the finance industry and the corporations, to make the real difference. And if you look at the Glasgow Net Zero Asset um, uh, alliances, mm -hmm. there are several of them. The we actually compromise of 425 asset management companies and insurance companies and the likes, compromising 130 trillion. That's 40% of the investable capital in the world. Mm -hmm. And most of us actually made promises to our clients that this is how we will invest their money. So yes, we are making a difference and we will make a difference. I'd like to hear that. President Jin, welcome. I'd like to throw that same question to you. What is, do you think, in your mind, the state of, of climate finance and making a green transition possible at the moment? How would you classify that? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think the amount uh, of financing needed for us to achieve the target of 1.5 degrees goal uh, is enormous. And uh, the uh, Numbers may differ from different, you know, researchers, institutions, or governments, but roughly we can say fifty trillion dollars would be needed by 2050 to reach the uh, objective. So this is a huge amount of resources, and obviously both the public sector and the private sector and our multilateral development banks would have to work together. So where does the money come from? I think if this is really, the climate change risk is really considered something uh, bordering on existential threat to the human society, and the allocation or reallocation of resources is a must. And I, I believe uh, it is possible uh, as long as the international consensus is there and if the commitment is there. So uh, we believe uh, the COP26 meeting in Glasgow is a very important step forward. And I think uh, something has to be done to translate the uh, pledges and the commitments into reality. And we in the multilateral demand bankers family are very much committed. We have a joint statement uh, announced by David Malpass, the president of the World Bank, indicating that the multilateral development banks would work together. So all in all, I think uh, the amount needed is huge, but it all depends on the political commitment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lynn, what do you think the state of play is for us? Uh, I, uh, I would not want to say that there is greenwashing going on intentionally. Right. I trust the people who have signed the GFANS document. Mm -hmm. I trust the Climate Action 100. I trust the sovereign wealth funds, the pension funds, the, the individuals who are truly committed to using their, their money and their financial power to, to green our planet. So, I, but, but, and in a way, a friend of mine said, nothing matters before the but. Right. So the but, <laughs> <laughs> so that's all the nice. The Those nice, are the niceties, so here it comes, but, right. But if we want the financial markets to do their job, the markets are smart, and the markets need a price on carbon. I think the most important role that government can play, and for that matter, the most important role that any of us can play in our positions of advocacy is to place a price on carbon. Because then the market has certainty and the market has a pr price 
so that the new technologies, the carbon capture, the blue and green hydrogen, the biomass, all those things that we know are the big solutions can be financed. And so I think short of a price on carbon, we are not going to see the most efficient movement of capital toward the goal of, as they said in Glasgow, keeping 1.5 alive. Keeping 1.5 alive indeed. Thank you, Lin. Dil Han. Uh, so I would agree with what Lin has said, but maybe I would just add on to what President Jin was talking about as well. I think for global um, finance to really have an impact on what we need to do to achieve 1.5 degrees requires partnership and collaboration between different sources of capital. And those different sources of capital coming together can allow us to address the many different dimensions that, that are required to get us into 1.5 degrees, whether it's decarbonization solutions, whether it's a transition from brown to, to green, uh, whether it's about um, uh, you know, pro providing capital and, and, and financing options, all these require collaboration. So on one hand, by governments in the context of public finance, multilateral development banks and agencies to allow for policy frameworks to come into, especially for emerging markets, uh, for in private capital, people like you know, sovereign wealth funds and pension funds and other investors, to corporates because they play an important role for that as well. Uh, philanthropic organizations as they are a provider of concessionary capital, all, all of these have to come together. And I want, want to say something about what Lynn said. I agree with her that we need to price carbon. And the reason why we need to price carbon is because you need to know the true cost of capital of your business model. It, the, the issue of physical risk and transition risk converge. And for transition risk, the question is, what is the true cost of, what's the true cost of capital for your business model, not now, but in 10 years' time or 15 years' time? Or, and, and, and that's why the price of carbon is important. But the price of carbon needs to be put in place in a way that doesn't work only as a disincentive. Right. Okay? It has to be an incentive for people to be able to invest in the solutions which are required. It has to be a disincentive from folks having to continue to do what they're doing without being part of the transition story, without thinking about the carbon intensity of business models. It also has to be an incentive for emerging markets, mm -hmm. where there is this huge dichotomy and challenge between the need to provide uh, you know, resources for urbanization to bring communities into a better life as against the need to have a greener planet. So, so there is an element there as well. I, I, think that's very, I think that's very well spotted. If it's a pure disincentive, it's not really going to drive the scale of the hundred trillion dollars, give or take, that you need to you know, deeply decarbonize uh, most of the transport power industrial sectors that we have right now. One moment, because I'm going to say, first of all, please send us some questions. And I want to go see our quiz questions up and see how we did. Could I pull up the results? You know, not bad. This is kind of what we were talking about in the green room. We're like, we're probably going to end up with too much, but it's still making a difference. The not much at all, um, majority of firms taking real action, that's a pleasure to see. Uh, the majority is, I think, still too high for our liking, but I think we can settle on we're, we're okay if there's a bit too much greenwashing, but we're still making a difference. Lisa, you had something that you wanted to add. Yeah, I just want to say, I think everybody agrees on the carbon tax, but I also think there's no, no time to waste. We can't wait yes. for it, and we can't keep sitting here asking for the governments to do more. Mm -hmm. So I think it's time for us. I mean, we're in this room, and people are listening. We're in charge of a lot of the capital of the world, so we can start acting, and people also concluded that money is smart. We're smart. We can look ahead. We yeah. can make those estimates. And as Minister Rania from Egypt said before, this is everybody's responsibilities. Mm -hmm. We can't just push it on to the governments. It's time that we start acting on the facts that we have today. Indeed. Then you, you wanted to add something. No, I, think that's, I think that's very true. And I, I think another aspect of a price on carbon for governments to consider is that, that the burden of that price can't go on the working and middle classes. So there's a proposal in the United States for a carbon dividend so that it's really the, the wealthy and the shareholders who will pay the brunt of the cost on carbon. 
and that society will step in to take care of the people for whom you know, that extra cost for electricity or transport is too much for them. So it actually is being viewed as a, as a, um, a progressive idea. And you know, I, I should add, 70, over 70 countries have some price, including, including China, uh, on carbon already. Whether, whether it's the right price can be, can be debated, but at least people are on the road to a price. And I think that's important. There is a pro proposal uh, now before Congress in the United States, the Wyden Amendment, which is one vote away from a carbon price. It's a very important It's an vote. important vote, so it's also very far away and one vote away. Very far away. <laughs> but... Uh, so I would agree with uh, Lynn that uh, there's a need for us to consider the impact of climate change and transition on our society. Mm -hmm. And there's a social cost to transition, especially if you're thinking about uh, the transition of business models the disruption to a particular sector, and it really it relates to workforce transition as well. Okay, so when you think about carbon taxes and the receipt of carbon taxes, quite apart from a carbon dividend that you were talking about, I think the question is, what would you do with those tax receipts? How will that go towards addressing the impact of climate change transition on society? Okay, so a number of dimensions, one of which is what you mentioned, Lynn, which is the increased costs and the burden to the middle income and even lower middle income. Uh, but the other part has to do with the fact that we have to make sure in the transition, everyone gets pulled along into a better world, that there is, in fact, a climate dividend as well. And I think that is a big issue, because if you're thinking about the transition, the benefits come later, the cost is born first. Right, right. And there's a need to address that cost as well. And if, if you think about the return to society in the longer run as a result of climate change, because you have to take the view that climate change is a good for society and for global society as a whole, then you know, who bears that cost up front? You know, that's an important question to ask. Thank you. Pr President yeah. Jin, um, from, from your perspective, um, are, are, we, are we adequately pricing risk and are we adequately concerned considering who bears these costs for making such big transitions. Uh, thank you very much for the question. But, but let, let me pick up the, uh, yes, the uh, points uh, my, my uh, panelists uh, raised, uh, carbon taxation, carbon price. I, I do believe that it is necessary for the consumers to know that there's a price uh, for the energy. And uh, it must uh, have a kind of, you know, sense that uh, we need to pay. But the issue is how to handle uh, the uh, tax receipts. Of course, we should allocate the resources for the investment in the renewables. And taxation is one thing, whether it should fall equally on all of uh, the people, regardless of the income, that could be discussed. But I do agree with Evelyn uh, uh, that uh, uh, Elaine that uh, probably uh, we should have differentiation, uh, differentiated the burdens. But I would like to highlight the point when we talk about the amount of resources needed, we we have to make a, a distinction between the investments in the renewable projects and in the R&D, mm -hmm. which would help us achieve technological breakthrough. My view is uh, the probably given the current technology, wind, windmill and the solar panel, and uh, there's a huge room for efficiency gains in the future. And uh, uh, at this moment, I think efficiency is still very much limited. So. We certainly, on the development banks, we can not uh, invest in some of the new technology. We're only investing in projects with proven technology because we are not venture capitalists. But it is important for the regulators, governments, to think about incentives to uh, the investment in R&D. 
without sufficient investment R&D, we just repeat this kind of low-efficient uh, renewable projects forever. So that is why I think it's very much important. That is why when you highlight the importance of tax price carbon and the levy carbon tax issues, a more important and crucial issue is how you most effectively use the resources raised from the taxation. Let me stop here. Thank, no, thank you very much. I think that this is actually very critically important. I would not call our current technologies solved yeah. in terms of what they can do, but they've given a sense of problems that are solvable. Uh, we, certainly we can deploy capital in the tens of trillions of dollars towards the things that we know work and we can scale them. But there are not only benefits and things to be gained and extracted from our current technologies by developing them further, but also a lot of sectors that we really don't address yet at all that are way beyond power and way beyond road transport. So things like decarbonizing the process of making cement and steel, aviation, heavy shipping, things like this, where you, know, you, run, it, you run into things that are chemistry problems in some cases, and you run into agency problems and others. And so how, how, do we, how do we move collectively here towards deploying capital that is constructive both develops new technologies, but also solves problems, like gets things in motion. And I, I'm, I'm curious, any, any of you on the panel who would like to jump in on that? Dilhan, I see your hand. I think Lin will. Oh, I think Lin's first? Will. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Ladies first. <laughs> no, no, age before beauty. <laughs> <laughs> and definitely before Which is time. true. <laughs> um, now, what I was going to say was the great advantage of the price on carbon is the lever that it gives yeah. to the development of more technology. So if you take carbon capture, carbon capture and a lot of the technologies, we know how to make blue hydrogen, we know how to make green hydrogen, we know how to do biomass, but none of it is economic. No one will pay for it because once it replaces the fossil fuel, whether it's fossil fuel in cement or steel or turning our electricity and so forth on, it, as long as we're not paying for that, then there's not an economic incentive to invest in the big solutions. Um, we have an economic incentive to invest in wind and solar. So from 1992 to 2019, wind and solar went from 0% of energy to 3%. In 2020, it increased by 20% solar, and uh, that means it'll, it'll double in four years. And wind increased by 17%, so it'll double in six years. And with a cost decrease of 90% as well. With a cost increase, but, but at the end of the day, that's going to only be 30% of, uh, so in two decades, it'll be 30% of our needs. So if we don't turbocharge the big solutions, yeah. like carbon capture can really help the planet. And that technology is inside of oil and gas companies. Um, they're the ones who know how to do that, but it doesn't cost $50 a ton, it costs $100 a ton. But it begins to become investable Either because you say, I'm going to do it, even if I lose money, and I think you'll see some companies doing that. But imagine if we had the lever of the capital markets, where the return was actually there for these investments. So it's not a lack of science mm -hmm. and technology and innovation. It's a lack of economics, and in return, it's a lack of political will. So if the politicians could garner the will to place a price, then the market could solve the problem. I'm curious, what's going to make a politician <laughs> make that decision? Mm -hmm. Like, what's, what's going to inspire that? And because I think this, it, it, this is a capital markets discussion, but it all has to run back through politics and policy. Like, what might inspire that change? Is there something happening now? Is there something that could happen in the future to make that change effective? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to venture into what goes into a politician's <laughs> mind, because that would be very dangerous. It's fair enough. Um, <laughs> but maybe I'll just say something. It's just follow up on what President Jin said. 
I think that governments need to be upfront with the population as to what it really means to do the transition. Okay. And remember, it's a journey. Okay, you want to get to 2050, it's 29 years from now. That doesn't mean that we wait for the last five years, we start now, but it's a journey. And as you go along, you know, the cost curve, the carbon abatement cost curve should come down if you see an acceleration capital being deployed. Now, what does it take to have that capital being deployed at that accelerated pace? Well, you need breakthroughs, first of all, but you need an incentive. That's where governments come in, to provide the framework for an incentive, whatever that means. It could be grants, it could be part of the carbon tax, et cetera, but you need incentive. You know, um, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, Bill Gates' firm, uh, took money from a bunch of very wealthy people, and he said to them, well, you're putting money in here, but don't expect to make money from it. But they've invested in a number of decarbonizing solutions and are actually, on the face of it, generating returns. So even though you, you are deploying capital as a force for good, there is that opportunity of making the returns, but it will not be in the normal time frame of a typical venture capital investment or a typical growth equity investment that you'll be looking for. So you have to be prepared to put capital down for longer gestation period to get the results. You'll have to be prepared to be able to take some zeros in the portfolio that you're investing in. And you've got to be prepared to invest even when, as President Jin said, it's not investable by a number of other people, which means TRLs one to six, you know, that's technology readiness levels. And there are currently companies who have, who are you know, engaged in solutions for decarbonization of the cement process, because it's the third largest emitter of CO2, 8%. And for steel, from blast furnacing to electric arc furnacing, for example, and that's 5% of carbon emissions. There's more money going to sustainable aviation fuels. Rolls-Royce has said by 2033, all the engines will be compatible with sustainable aviation fuel. And if you own an airline like we do, you're not going to reduce emissions by the most efficient aircraft. That will maybe right. get you 25, 30% about sustainable aviation fuel. But that requires policy, uh, policy making, but it requires a number of people coming together. It's, you know, who, pay, base, uh, who bears the cost of aviation air travel? It has to be a shared cost. Yes. It can't be just on the airline, otherwise you won't have any way of traveling from one place to another except by ship. It's got to be airports, it's got to be the individual, but you need to have the solutions out there. So let me just say something about private capital. There's a lot of private capital available. If you look at GFANS and, and look at the number of net zero commitments made, 140 odd trillion dollars, right? You take 1% of that, that's 1.4 trillion. Now, if investors are basing returns on say five or 6% for the rest of the decade, Okay, taking 1% and looking at the remainder, you know, um, you know, compounding at 5 or 6%, you can definitely afford to put that into things that matter for climate change transition. Okay, so the question for investors is how much of your capital are you prepared to make risk-based, not risk capital, everything is risk capital, okay, right. when, you're, when you're allocating capital, risk-based capital. What President Jin talked about, R&D. Because if you're really thinking about solutions that matter in the long run, you have to invest today to get those benefits in any event. That's right. Just you would you all wanted to say something. Yeah, it's just uh, two comments. I, I completely agree with you, Dylan. There are, um, you mentioned uh, politicians yes. who dares to go first. And I mean, if I look at European Union, they're considering a greenhouse gas emission tax on shipping, for instance, to actually start transitioning that huge industry that really needs to push forward. But when you, and then going back to Dylan's comment, it's about the commitments, and we have those 130 trillion in the net zero alliances. And committing to those, you actually sign up to publicly declare your goals. And it's easy to follow trail. We put a goal on how much we will actually put in renewable energy, how much we need to invest of our portfolio in order to be in line with the international LNG, their, their trajectories. So if everybody did that, then we do have a large chunk of capital going into those areas that desperately need it. But it's, um, it's about setting those goals and following it up. And with the transparency we're starting to see, hopefully the, the notion or the feeling of greenwashing will actually uh, be a memory let's and hope, let's <laughs> people hope so. start acting. Let's hope so, certainly. What do, you, do, you see, uh, do you see within the corporate world that enhanced commitment? I mean, I see from the very early stage yeah. to what Dilhan mentioned, quite a lot of appetite, but do we see the, the sense that this is not just something that should be done, but importantly, I think, an element of growth? 
But Do you it, see that? Yeah, and it is happening. If we looked at our portfolio, we managed about 220 billion US dollars. So we looked at our capital a year ago, and 12% of our asset under management actually had science-based targets mm -hmm. that were approved. If we look at that same portfolio today, or with where we're invested, it's actually 26%. And that movement wow. is just in one year. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're meeting a lot of the companies. We're, meeting, we're investing in 70 markets, 3,000 companies, and we talk to our companies every year. And the interest is huge. And the ones that haven't set targets, they're really curious about how to. Right. So I, I think the moment is there. It's coming. So you, doubling, essentially, the amount of commitment in one year. Yeah. And what's next year going to be, do you think? I don't know, but by 2030, our goal is to have 60% mm -hmm. of, of the companies in which we invest uh, committed to science-based targets or alike, something similar. I mean, this is developing. It's an emerging thing. It's gonna, probably going to be better metrics. Everything is improving by the year. And by 2030, 100% of our companies needs to have uh, clim climate targets. Fantastic. President Jin, I'm curious how you think of, of things such as the Science-Based Targets Initiative you know, committing, uh, committing in a dedicated way uh, to meeting the Paris Agreement on a portfolio basis. Um, I'm curious if things like that from your perspective, a multilateral perspective, are also meaningful. Do they, do they move your investment thesis and your investment priorities? Thank you. Um, we, as you know, we, uh, uh, ours is a new bank, and we are only six years into operation. Yes. But from the very beginning, uh, we made it very much clear the bank is lean, clean, and green. <laughs> we promote green economy. We finance the transition to low carbon, eventually net zero. But as you know, our uh, financial re uh, resources are limited. And the combined resources of the World Bank, ADB, EBRD, and all those multilateral development banks are limited. So what we need to do is to, to provide some guidance to the uh, developing borrowing members to indicate how they should allocate resources for the green economy. So I think that's the, that's the kind of leverage. It's the not just the financial leverage, it's also the moral leverage. So we, we think it's very much important. For instance, when I declare that we are not going to finance any coal-fired power plants uh, two years ago, uh, it, I think it served as a very clear message that the model of development banks like ours will only promote green economy. And uh, as I said, the joint declaration by the, by the multilateral demand banks can also uh, help the borrowing countries to understand that they need to work with all these financiers in a way which can accelerate their transition to low carbon and uh, net zero. So the role of our banks and MDBs is to serve as the guidance. Uh, it's not the real resources we can provide to make a difference, it's very much limited. And uh, I think we need to work with the uh, private sector. Uh, the vast private sector resources could be tapped and in a way which we can all uh, work together to finance the climate change mitigation and adaptation. Now, when we promote ESG, the financial institutions and the business companies all understand their social responsibility to promote the fast transition. I think it's important for us to mobilize more resources for that purpose. I think it would be a silent moral persuasion, moral persuasion, so that people who don't do it would have to follow suit. So this is uh, something I think is very much important. And another issue I think we need to deal with is the cooperation uh, among the political leaders, elected political leaders, the multilateral development banks, the public sector institutions, and the private sector. The elected political leaders have term limits. They have four years, five years, and how could we make sure that they will look at the public interests uh, beyond their term limits 
I think I certainly it is very good to make pledges to fight against climate change, but how to handle the consequences of probably some impact, short term impact on the uh, people's lives. So I think it's very much important to make sure this would be handled well. And uh, in France, the Gilets jaunes, the Yellow Jackets incident, also tells us how important it is not to, to, to do something which would have caused a backlash against uh, uh, this uh, push for green economy. Now, for the private sector, private sector institutions, particularly financial institutions, I think the pressure would be mounting uh, for them to direct the resources for the, for the renewables. But there's, again, an issue of how these institutions would be able to sustain themselves uh, as the financial institutions. So it is very important for them to identify very good projects, profitable projects. And uh, sometimes you see so many, so much money chase so few good deals. So there are so many issues. I think we only need to work out by working together with each and every uh, one special responsibility. Ability, but the international cooperation in a broad sense, in my view, is very, very important. Thank you, President Jin. And we are actually coming right up against time, I'm afraid. But I want to say, uh, I think we've hit all of the right points on what needs to be done. I really quite enjoy the notion of you know, moral suasion, which I think is actually very important. But also, you know, the, the growing sense on a portfolio basis, on a technology basis, uh, on a policy basis, ideally that we are, we are moving in the right direction. I look forward to us having this conversation five years from now and seeing both a back test, being, seeing what we've been surprised by on the upside, uh, we have more work to do. So thank you very much, all of you in the audience, for joining this conversation, and thank you to everyone here on the stage. And with that, we are finished. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the stage, Bloomberg Television anchor and editor-at-large, Francine Lacroix, and chairman and CEO of the Goldman Sachs Group, David M. Solomon. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, David. Thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon, and thank you for... Thank you for having me. We're going to have a robust conversation over we the are. 20 minutes. Okay. We can start with sustainability. So I know you've signed the GFANCE, which is the Mark Carney approach in Glasgow, which is net zero by 2050. But at the same time, you're still financing fossil fuel. So how long will this transition take? Well, um, the transition is going to take a while. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're dealing. Let's, let's step back just, just for one second. Climate change and driving a transition to make our world more green is hugely important, hugely important. But I also think at the same point in time, we have to recognize that we're trying to drive very dramatic change and that we need sound government policy, mm -hmm. solid action and activity by private sector market participants, significant capital allocation, especially in risk capital that can really drive technological innovation and change, and it's going to take time. And I think there's got to be a lot of dialogue. I went and I sat in a round table today with Mike Bloomberg um, and a bunch of other participants here where we talked about a variety of ideas to try to accelerate it, but I think there's a real agreement that while this is 
an urgent thing that requires attention, we have to be realistic that we're making drastic change in our systems, our processes, et cetera, and that this is gonna take some time. So what does it mean for finance? When is, is, is it going to be fully transitioned? And again, if some of these rules are not mandatory, do you worry that they won't have enough teeth? Well, I, I can't answer the question when it's gonna be fully transitioned. And remember that when we talk about
And so, you know, I, I do think people don't remember when Paul Volcker raised interest rates by 300 basis points on a Sunday afternoon. So there are a lot of factors that will go into, you know, how this process plays out. It's unclear, but I certainly think that, that thoughtful market participants are thinking about it. In my conversations with big institutions, they're thinking about it. And trying to balance participate and have relative performance based on participation um, and what happens as we unwind some of this and we rebalance a little bit. So are, are you telling me that you're worried that, you know, markets are too cool about it just because they've made money for the last 10 years? Well, I, 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 I do think that, you know, generally speaking, um, everyone feels quite smart right now because most of the things that you invest in are going up. Um, that's not the way it normally works. <laughs> so um, I, I, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not a great predictor, but my experience tells me this is a moment in time um, that's probably not a sustainable moment in time. But, but then it would be what, an economic shock? So away from an inflation monetary policy, it, it, could, what it, could it be? It could be a change in the perspective of the course of economic activity. Um, it could be some sort of a geopolitical shock. It could be that something goes wrong with respect to our emergence from the pandemic and we have a different set of events that change the perspective. But all of this is based on kind of confidence and a forward view. And, you know, I would say at the moment the forward view is quite optimistic. Um, if it stays optimistic and central bankers, you know, handle the withdrawal in an appropriate way with the right communication, there's a chance we can do it, you know, in a balanced way. There's a chance something could go wrong. Got to be prepared for both. <laughs> uh, how do you prepare? Actually, <laughs> for both. Well, you, you prepare by, you know, thinking about if the world looked differently, you know, how would it affect different assets and, um, you know, how would you, how would you feel if, 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 if things were worth less? Yeah. Worth, not worthless, but worth, worth less. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so in, um, so in that context, you know, we do, we do a lot of, we talk to our clients a lot about different scenarios and, you know, we think a lot about our own balance sheet and, you know, our own propensity for risk um, as we try to navigate those things. Talk to me a little bit about China. So you, you're optimistic longer term in China. Do you ever get any pressure from Washington f to grow less fast in China? We are... Um, we're very committed to building our business in China, but in the context of the fact that Goldman Sachs operates, you know, globally all over the world, and we serve governments and institutions uh, and corporations all over the world, and given the importance that China, the important position that China plays economically in the world, you really can't be Goldman Sachs without without participating in that. I, I, I wouldn't say there's direct pressure on us to change our long-term plans to grow our business in China. Uh, is it possible at some point in time something goes on geopolitically between the US and China? And because we're a US company, there's either pressure or directive for us to do certain things differently. Sure, that's a possibility. Uh, but we think about this with a 10, 20, 30 year perspective, not with a you know, next couple of year perspective. And so we're long term committed uh, to continuing to serve our clients by having the resources and the capabilities in China that allow our clients globally, you know, participate in markets. Do you worry that your license could be revoked at a moment's notice? Well, we worked for 17 years to get it, and so we've only had it for a few weeks. So I'd, I'd, like, to, um, I'd like to think we'll hold on to it for more than a few weeks before, um, before it'll be revoked. But I, I, think that, um, I think that China, after, after holding institutions like ours at bay in terms of taking control of our entities, in China, I think China wants to grow its capital markets. They want more listing activity in Hong Kong or onshore. Um, and I think the participation of global institutions in their capital markets strengthens their capital markets. And so my guess is they continue to support that, but the world can change. Um, the world can change quite fast. <laughs> when you look at some of the shocks, and we mentioned some of the shocks as well, when you look at the, the prospects of China, how much do you want to grow in China, and how difficult is it to access, for example, talent in Hong Kong and to retain talent in Hong Kong because of the quarantines? Well, I, I, I think it's important to put it in perspective that while you know, we have a business in China and it's a good-sized business and, and it's growing, it's actually a very small business in the overall scope of Goldman Sachs. Yeah. You know? so, but given the economic activity there um, and the size of the economy, um, over the next 10, 20 years, it could obviously be a bigger percentage, you know, of the business. And so we'll continue to serve our clients and try to allow it to grow. You know, talent acquisition um, is an important part of our business and something we're very, I've always been focused on. I think that, that we're a relatively attractive place. 
for people to come work, to grow, to learn, to build a network, et cetera. We hire a lot of young people into our organization. One of the things I don't think people realize about our organization is that 50% of the people who work in our organization are in their 20s. And so it's a very, very young organization. And one of the reasons for that is because people feel that they can learn a lot and they can build a great network and they can get a great set of experience and that's an important part of our ecosystem. I, I wouldn't say that it's, I would say that it's, we're going through one of those periods where it's more competitive for talent than it is in other periods. The, um, globally? But glo globally, globally. Um, I do think that, um, you know, there are some challenges, you know, China, Hong Kong, um, have a certain approach right now to COVID and uh, therefore they're relatively closed. Um, this is my first trip to Asia uh, since February of, um, of 2020, which would be very unusual. I'd be in Asia you know, four or five times a year normally. Uh, and I haven't been to Hong Kong or China um, and don't expect that I'll be able to go for quite some time. And so, you know, in the context of that, we have a lot of people that work and operate there. Many of them are you know, our local Chinese, um, but many of them hold passports from other parts of the world. And certainly being restricted in terms of leaving or coming back, the family pressures, et cetera, you know, that's, that's not a great dynamic for talent, but we're at a moment in time where we're gonna have to navigate that. And that's, you know, that's certainly a headwind for global talent in that part of the world right at this moment. Do you think it'll loosen up? Well, I, I, I think ultimately, um, I think ultimately it, it, it should, it'll have to. It's, um, I don't think it's going to loosen up quickly, meaning, you know, in the next couple of months. But, you know, I think economically, and there's just one person's view from the outside, when you, when you restrict travel in and out, when you restrict the ability for people to come and visit and engage, for people to leave to go engage around the world, over time, it has an impact on your economic activity. And so... You know, I'm sure that, that the leaders in China are thinking about that and balancing that based on how, you know, they are, you know, protecting, you know, their population from COVID and executing on their plan. But at some point, I would assume that we'll get to a different place. Uh, I just think they're on a different path and a different trajectory based on their facts and circumstances. What are you most excited about at this juncture in time? Well, I, I continue to be incredibly excited about the amount of innovation that exists in the world um, and all the great ideas and you know, all the change that technology and innovation are driving. And by the way, I'm excited about technology and innovation driving change around climate, where we started the conversation. I'm a big believer that we've got to find a path for more risk capital to get into really driving technological change um, that, that can help us, you know, improve a bunch of the technologies that exist to make our, our world greener, but we've got to take the cost differential out. And I think we can really make progress. And I, you know, we, we can complain about all the things that are wrong, but I'm quite optimistic that we'll do better than people think over some period of time. And this is coming out of what region? And do, do we see enough partnerships, for example, on green technology between the US and China? Well, we, I, I, I think that there are, this, is coming out of, this is coming out of a variety of different places where people are trying to innovate um, broadly. I do think that one of the great opportunities for China and the West to cooperate, you know, is around climate and climate technology broadly. I think ultimately, though, you know, governments are going to have to partner with risk capital to try to find ways to accelerate and make more investable, you know, certain unknown technologies. Um, and you know, I'm hopeful that that's something that will continue to progress. But I'm, I, I just think the pace of innovation in the world is only accelerating, uh, and that's that's exciting and some of the changes that are coming think about these vaccines are an absolute miracle they're an absolute miracle in the pace but the pace of change and what those vaccines and the technology behind those vaccines can do for other health issues and how we can continue to make progress on a whole variety of issues in the health and bioscience space you know, just gives me a lot of optimism about the direction of travel. Does it change our composition of the economies to a point where actually you know that could be a market risk? disruption coming? Well, you know, it's life expectancy is a positive for economic growth. You know, the, 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 the more we can improve health and well-being in the world, the more we can get people around the world to participate because their health and well-being are also extending life, you know, that, that drives economic growth and economic activity. So, you know, over time, there's lots of opportunity for growth in the world if we continue to make technological progress and continue to advance. And I'm, I'm, I'm just always, I'm a glass half full guy. I worry 
as, as, a, as a manager of our organization, I worry about what can go wrong a lot, but I don't wake up every day worrying about what can go wrong. I wake up every day being optimistic about what can go right and then try to mitigate the things that will go wrong along the way. What do your employees ask you the most? I know they, they've had, what, record bonuses? I think the best bonuses... Well, we haven't, we haven't paid any bonuses yet because we pay people at the end of the year after the year's over based on our performance. Certainly because our performance is good, um, you know, compensation will, will, will increase this year because we're, we're you know, pay for performance-based business the way our business model works. But, you know, our employees are focused on the things I think most employees are focused on today. First and foremost, focused on their health and their safety and their well-being. And I think one of the things that's been very challenging about, about COVID is just kind of the isolation yeah. of society. Generally, I think people are social animals. People want to be out. They want to be with other people. You know, I hear it from our employees. They want to socialize. They want to connect. Um, we're doing, depending on where you are in the world, we've got you know, a reasonable amount of people back, you know, participated in the office. But first and foremost, people want to be working hard, they want to be motivated, they want their families safe, they want their own you know, safety, security, and health. And so you know, we spent a lot of time you know, focusing on that for our organization um, broadly. Uh, secondly, you know, our employees are, are, are interested in what's going on in the world and you know, how Goldman Sachs as an organization is contributing positively to that. And you know, I think all organizations you know, today have to be able to really articulate how they're trying to contribute to moving the world forward, moving our society forward. And our employees care a lot about that. I think employees, you know, everywhere care about those things. David Solomon, thank you so much. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks. Took 20 minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
requires a global solution. And the outcome of uh, COP26, uh, while um, uh, it uh, gives some sense of optimism, while it is uh, not as much as uh, we hoped to achieve, but I think there is signs of uh, progress. Uh, I'm confident that if we continue to work together, uh, we will be able uh, to find a solution uh, going forward, whether it is through technology or through collaboration or through uh, cutting back on our uh, uh, consumption and uh, wastage. I think there are many opportunities for us to work together. I think for Singapore and Australia, for example, we have many uh, uh, collaboration on uh, sustainability and we are discussing uh, the, uh, green economy uh, agreement, explore opportunities. And as in a way, in time to come, uh, I think sustainability is not just a burden, uh, uh, it's something that we need to do, but I hope that we can embrace sustainability so that it becomes something that we really want to do. And I am confident and optimistic that the younger generation particularly are beginning to change their demand and their needs and they are looking at sustainability as something that they want to have. And in their consumption pattern, they are also beginning to choose in an informed way to choose more sustainable products, services and products that are produced in a sustainable way. So I think this gives a hope that uh, over, over time, I think the uh, um, companies, the uh, businesses, and the people will come along to uh, recognize and embrace sustainability as part of, part of our way of life. Thank you, Minister. And I should point out that the Minister, as well as um, having a very serious portfolio within the government, is also coordinating the COVID response for Singapore. So you have probably been one of the busiest people on the planet <laughs> over the last year. So thank you for all of us are very busy. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, you're, you're running one of the most interesting and important companies for the energy transition in Europe. Uh, you come from uh, the conventional energy background. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your own personal journey through this space and where you're taking Algi. Yeah, so it's, it's really a very exciting time to be in the energy space uh, where we are going through this transformation. At NG, we are going full speed into renewable arenas. We are very excited about obviously the dropping cost of the technology of renewables, which is making it uh, so attractive uh, for, for you know to, to supply to many of our customers. Of course, the issue with renewables is that it remains intermittent, and so you know moving to now the, the technology gap that we have to bridge, which I'm very excited about, is the ability to offer to customers 100% renewable energy offers. And you know, it sounds simple, it's not. If you're in Europe, you know, sometimes you have wind, sometimes you have solar, rarely both, and at night, you know, definitely uh, very complicated from the solar standpoint. So here, it's the ability, and Angie has that expertise, which we're very proud, is this ability to package and offer green PPAs on a 24 hours, seven days basis to our customers. And we have just signed a one in a kind of such of offer uh, with Google in Germany that allows them to be guaranteed that every time that they consume energy, it is indeed from renewable sources. And that's very exciting. It takes, obviously, you need to have the assets, so you need to have producing assets, but that's not enough. You need to have a green energy portfolio, and you need to have energy management systems to enable you to provide these solutions. So that's extremely exciting. And that, of course, all has a technological backbone to it. Absolutely. A lot of smartness, a lot of intelligence. In fact, I think you might be commenting uh, on some of your solutions as well at Envision. But a lot of smarts, a lot of smarts. It's not just, you know, solar, solar panels and, and wind where there is technology, but it's the ability to integrate and then to source the right supply at the right time so that 24 hours, seven days a week, our customers get renewable energy. And that's very exciting because it's a bit you know, counterintuitive. Absolutely. And we've heard on uh, many of the other panels, not just about climate change, but other areas we've covered during the forum, the need for public and private sector cooperation. And I think it's great that we have two ministers from sure. uh, important governments along with two very successful and important corporate leaders. So minister, tell us a little bit about what's happening in Australia. Uh, and how you feel about the pace of the energy transition in Australia. First of all, can I just say how great it is to be here and to be <laughs> here in person uh, on stage with these wonderful presenters and your good self and also to have an audience. And I commend Bloomberg for putting this on because, and Singapore for hosting because the world's getting back to normal again and uh, we're, we're living and breathing that here at this 
conference, which is just wonderful. I'm incredibly optimistic that technology will be the key to solving the issues that we're facing with emissions reduction. And you see it on this panel here. Uh, you've got two members of government uh, who are at this moment negotiating a green economy agreement. And our chief negotiator will head to Singapore next week uh, to really start firming up that agreement. And it's hopefully an agreement which the rest of the region and maybe the rest of the world will look at and seek to adapt. And the key to it is to make sure that we're sharing uh, the information that's necessary to drive the technological advancement that we'll need to solve for this problem. And the two companies here are also working with the Australian government on doing, doing that. ONGI has serious and significant investments in renewable energy in Australia, and we're looking at partnerships around hydrogen, which will be one of the absolute keys going forward. And uh, Li Zhang, he is in a joint venture with one of our biggest iron ore producers to see what technology we will need to drive this transition. And once again, hydrogen is one of the keys to that, and there's a joint venture looking at that. So really, in this panel here, you see how we are going to solve for this problem. So I, I think the future will be bright. I think we'll do to it. I've just been with one of the largest agricultural manufacturing companies in the world. They're also looking for solutions when it comes to land use and when it comes to agriculture. That's 25% of emissions. Uh, one of the areas that we don't talk about much, but we have to solve for that as well, get more carbon into the soil. They're doing enormous research and investment, uh, including with the Australian government on how we solve for that. So definitely technology will get us there. And I'm very confident with the help of this panel that we're at the forefront of helping achieve that. That's terrific. So, Lee, you run, you run I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the only mainland Chinese company that's committed to 100% renewables by the middle of the decade. Yes. You're confident you're going to meet that goal and tell us about it? For sure. So, we even commit by 2028, vision will be net zero for entire scope one, two, three. So, tell us about the technological advancement that's facilitated that kind of. So, you know, this, this could be recently in, in vision come out uh, some invention, which is could be interesting for all, all of us because it solves our own problem. We created the world first net zero industrial park. So why we do that? Because actually you see that abundant renewable energy cost is lower than fossil fuel, but you need a big transmission grid takes time to transfer energy to load center. Now, what we can do is we shift our demand, especially, for instance, we create this net zero park in Inner Mongolia. The wind cost is only 1.5 US cents per kilo hour. And combined with solar and the seasonal storage and the short-term storage with digital solution, as, you know, so, so energy offering, the 100% renewables, we offer the 100% renewable directly without a grid to the customer, which customer we're starting with ourselves because we're making batteries, consume lots of energy. We calculate if we do not go to net zero by 2028, that year, we're going to emit 20 million tons CO2 a year. Mm. So we found this net zero park is a solution. We're making the cathode and the cathode precursor battery set, and also we introduced the largest commercial vehicle company in China to making EV with this industrial park. Then, interesting is we are 100% green making. At the same time, we're making green products for the society. So this is net zero industrial park. Could happen everywhere, could happen in Australia, and also could happen in Singapore as well. You, you know, so you, you have some island nearby, which is, could be create a net zero data center, for instance, and could happen in Spain. So it's a replica business model. So I told you, very optimistic group of people here. <laughs> um, we are so naturally optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, otherwise we won't be here. Yeah, that's right, that's right, yeah. and, and it is indeed ministry. Just a, a quick response uh, to Ms. Lee's uh, comment. In fact, uh, we are looking at uh, making uh, our Jurong Island which is a chemical and a, a, a petrochemical island uh, to achieve uh, uh, eventually a net uh, carbon neutral. So 
we are trying to uh, achieve what you said. We might not be able to do it for the whole of Singapore, but we do intend to uh, have a specific project to see whether we can get there. Mm. And we'll be very happy to discuss with you how you can help us to get there. I got answers already for you. <laughs> Jurong Island is always on top of mind because Singapore, the toughest challenge is decarbonized Jurong Island. It's, it's about a patch of chemical. Mm. But today, four of us can create a collaboration. You know why? So Jurong Island could take on the synthetic biology now people is able to making the bio nylon cheaper than petrochemical nylons. So what do you need? You need a green hydrogen come from Australia, convert to green ammonia. Yes. And you take the agriculture residue from Southeast Asia. Then NG could create this project, envision, provide the technology voilà. to yeah. decarbonize your petrochemical business. You see, we have so JV, JV developing. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and that, just to yes. add to that point, that is what we're going to need to do as a globe. We've got to work together, right. and we've got to use the technology and work together to achieve it. If we all try and solve for it ourselves, yeah. um, it won't work. We've got to use all the collective knowledge that we have, all the collective technology we have, and be prepared to share it if we're going to solve for this. And it's not about putting up barriers to try and get people to act. It's about actually tearing barriers down and getting the type of collaboration that you're hearing from here that will lead to us getting to where we need to in a way that brings us all together rather than divides us. So. It's gotten so positive up here, I feel the need to bring it down a little bit. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, we're coming out of an, uh, an era of technological advancement in communications technology that had a lot of promise at the beginning. I'm old enough to remember when, <clears throat> excuse me, Facebook was going to bring the world together in a way that it uh, never had before. And it strikes me that a lot of the people involved in the clean tech sector are similar, similarly optimistic, shall we say, about the prospects for energy. Uh, is there a point at which we're getting a little ahead of ourselves in this debate, that, um, in this discussion rather, that we're not seeing the pitfalls, the unintended consequences that we're suffering through from the growth of platforms, for instance? <laughs> I'm gonna have to recalibrate. <laughs> well, uh, first uh, I must uh, say that uh, uh, while we are optimistic, uh, as I mentioned in my earlier comment, that it's still a very long journey. Mm, yeah. And there are still obstacles along the way. There may be solutions, but the solutions are not easy to come by. Let's take uh, Singapore as an example. Singapore, uh, in fact, uh, sustainability is something that we know very well from many, many uh, uh, decades ago. When we started the nation building, we have uh, practically zero resources. And we have to ensure that our development, our economic development, social development is done in a sustainable way. We optimize, we economize, we minimize uh, whatever we need to use so that we are able to uh, use the least and do the most. And one example is uh, we recycle our drinking water uh, to, uh, so that we are, are less dependent on the imported water. And we also look at how we can conserve our energy, conserve our land so that we can maximize uh, whatever we have. And so I think Sustainability is something that we live by uh, from right from the beginning. But of course, uh, with uh, uh, additional challenges of a decarbonization, uh, we need to do a lot more. And for us, uh, we uh, unfortunately do not have abundant supply of uh, uh, renewable energy, and we have a very limited in, in land. Solar power is something that we have uh, done quite a lot. Uh, we have put uh, solar cell on practically every rooftop and uh, every uh, empty space that you can see, we have put on the uh, solar cell. And we have also started putting solar cells on uh, reservoirs as, as well as uh, on our seabeds. So these are the things that we try to do to maximize uh, our renewable uh, source of energy. But there's still a limit to how far we can go. There are some technologies that are very promising, whether it's uh, hydrogen uh, or even carbon capture, which will help us to decarbonize. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of these are still have uh, significant technical technological uh, hurdles. And of course, uh, cost is still a, a factor. We are also recently talking about importing uh, energy electricity, uh, green electricity from as far away as uh, Australia. Uh, but uh, as you can imagine, there are a 
enormous challenges in bringing electricity from Australia to Singapore. But uh, never say no, so we continue to try, continue to explore, and hopefully we'll be eventually find a solution uh, to a sustain sustainability for us, even for Singapore. Catherine. Yeah, maybe I will comment a little bit on hydrogen because, you know, there is so much buzz around hydrogen, and particularly green hydrogen, and what we see is that indeed there's going to be some things that are easier than others. Mm -hmm. So the easier stuff are the stuff that we are doing indeed in Australia with Yara, which is a big manufacturer of fertilizer. And Yara needs hydrogen, today uses hydrogen. It's just gray hydrogen, so very, very carbon intensive hydrogen. So here we have the usage. So what we do with Yara and our partners, we do a green hydrogen production and it's a drop in mm -hmm. then into Yara existing process. So here you can see how feasible it is. It's a cost issue. We have the help of the Australian government and we make that project work and we envisage phase one, phase two, phase three. So you can see how that's fairly easy to do. Where it gets difficult is when the user of hydrogen has to invest billion of dollars to change their processes. And here you get into, for example, the steel industry, how to base sectors where, yes, hydrogen is going to be probably the solution, but for that, they need to invest major dollars and it's going to take some time before the demand is actually a reality. Mm -hmm. And so here you, you're there, you want to produce hydrogen, but the usage is going to be there five years later and a few billion euros spent after. So you can see how both calendar and economics here get challenged. And so what's very important for us as potential producers and also infrastructure pro provider is to really understand the demand. So anything that can help us aggregate that demand uh, is going to be very helpful and to understand timing and then also the cost curves and, and, uh, and that's really important. So the first movers coalition that you know John Kerry launched at COP26 is, is a very nice step towards that direction, which is really trying to say, okay, we're going to put the people who's going to need uh, hydrogen or, or near zero steel or, or whatever low carbon stuff, we'll put them together. There's going to be some commitment and an agreement that is going to be a bit more expensive, but at least the supply, the, the, the producers will have some visibility then that we can pass on to the technology provider, whether it's Envision or electrolyzer manufacturer, who also need that visibility in order to get their costs down. And in, in your view, how important is carbon pricing as a policy to underpin that entire... I think carbon pricing is very important. Yeah, very important. And to have a bit of stability and mm -hmm. visibility in carbon pricing, yes, really important. Excellent. So going to your question, I, I think it's a very good one. And I think geostrategic challenges will remain while we deal with this issue. And it's something that we'll all have to have in the back of our minds. But if you look at even what's happened uh, in the last seven days, uh, the way that the US and China were able to come together um, to be able to say, OK, this is something that we need to, to deal with together because it is a global challenge, uh, I think does point the way that we should be able to come some of those geostrategic challenges to be able to deal with this. But we can't um, be completely idealistic and think that that's not in the background and that's something which will be completely put aside. But I think all of us understand that given the global nature, that we will have to work in one way or another in partnership, even though those geostrategic challenges will be there in the background. And that's, I think, all of our hope that, in a way, that this is one of those issues that will be able to bring us together rather than to be one where, where you're seeing um, competition for, for, for geostrategic purposes. So I, I think there is the ability there of more than any other issue probably for us to be able to bring that, bring that together. And look, I agree with what um, Catherine says. Hydrogen, I, I think, especially for those that don't want to go down the nuclear road, uh, is very much um, a key to how we're going to solve for this problem. But it is going to be incredibly challenging. It's very easy to say hydrogen. It's very hard to commercially produce it, especially to be able to export at a price, uh, which is going to generate uh, the type of returns and the type of energy that's required at, at this stage. But it doesn't have to be hydrogen. One of the biggest electricity users 
in Australia is uh, our aluminium smelters. And one of, the, one of the smelters in Australia is already looking at how they can use renewable wind plus battery to, uh, with some backup from coal and you can use carbon capture and storage utilisation. So basically, we are fairly optimistic in the next five to six years you could potentially have one of the biggest users of electricity in Australia, which is a green aluminium smelter. Mm -hmm. Now, we've still got a way to go, but it's something which a decade ago would have seemed completely unrealistic for, for, because you need the firming capability. Now, um, especially with what's happening with, with battery storage, is not beyond us in maybe about the next five to six years. Right. Well, I see we only have six and a half minutes left, so I'm not going to open a discussion of nuclear, uh, probably <laughs> to everybody else's uh, uh, happiness on the panel. Uh, Lee, I want uh, to get you to share with the audience something you said in the green room there, and that is the proper relationship between the innovative capacity of the private sector and the global macro policy function of multilateral for like COP26. He said something very provocative backstage that uh, I wonder if you could share with everybody sure. else. What I want to say is technology will never disappoint us. Although sometimes the government policy of could disappoint us. If we compare the Glasgow COP with the Paris COP, not too much difference, to be honest. Five years passed. But you know what have achieved for the technology side? Renewable energy costs up 50%. Mm -hmm. If you compare 10 years ago with Copenhagen COP, renewable energy dropped 90%. Mm -hmm. True. Technology is flying, but only technology is not sufficient. You need to turn technology into the scalable product. Not even scalable product is not sufficient. You need to turn into the iconic project. This chain is complicated, is long. So that's why collaborations and the government policy support, all kinds of things should happen. Mm. So come back to hydrogen. Do you know, so our friend, Andrew Forrest, his ambitious target. How much electrolyte do you need? He probably need a five to 10 gigawatt a year to make this hydrogen. But you know, the largest hydrogen output factory maybe is only 0 0.5 gigawatt a year. Where can we get hydrogen electrolyzer today? We don't have gigafactory for hydrogen electrolyzer. Right. So lots of, you know, this industrialization is the key. Mm. Technology alone is not sufficient, industrialization. May so, I just uh, add a point to me? I, I think uh, I, I like the optimism, and uh, I, it is important that we focus uh, and invest in technology and change our industrialization process. But it is also important for us to take a uh, whole of nation approach because it will involve people, users, consumers. You have to change the habit to yes. save energy and so on and yes. don't uh, squander it away. And that is why we roll out, uh, for Singapore, we roll out the Singapore Green Plan 2030, which encapsulates what we have been doing now and what we want to do over the next 10 years up to 2030 to move the people, to mobilize the people along, whether it will involve uh, changing the way we live, changing our, uh, electrifying our uh, motor transport, uh, changing our power generation, decarbonize it, and also changing our industrial processes, like you mentioned. Yeah. So I think we require a whole of nation approach, mm. and we are hoping that uh, as governments, our job is to really mobilize the nation yes. to move in the, in the right direction. Yeah. So I, I can't let this panel end without asking you this question. We, we so far have been talking about technological innovation and measures that will reduce, hopefully, the rate at which we're emitting greenhouse causing gases into the atmosphere. But of course, there's already a trillion tons of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that have no business being there. Uh, and if we wait, depending on the study, it'll take somewhere between 30 to 50 years for them to abate naturally. Is there anything going on in the direct air capture uh, technology sector that gives you confidence that we could achieve some breakthrough at scale that would allow us to do carbon removal at a, a rate that's commensurate with the problem? Maybe. Lee? You know, 
I have been searching for best carbon capture technology. You know what's my answer? My answer, the best carbon technology, cap capture knowledge and storage knowledge is coal. Think about coal. Every one ton of coal, coal is absorbing 2.5 ton CO2. With normal temperature, normal pressure, zero, zero cost, just burn, just on your ground. What shall we do is just stop burning coal, which is the best carbon capture technology, which made 400 million years ago. <laughs> so, we have, so we just stop what? burning coal using renewable energy. So Amen stop burning coal. <laughs> stop burning coal, I think <laughs> we could almost. So lowest cost Conversely. for carbon storage. So we have a question from the audience here. I think you can all see it. The world will find a technological silver bullet to save us from climate catastrophe. A, no, we need profound economic and cultural change. Well, I'm not gonna read the answers. You guys tell me, where are you on the spectrum here? And we'll give the audience a moment to answer the question as well. Catherine. I mean, definitely B, definitely. Not, not to forget, we didn't talk too much about it, but the social impact, uh, stakeholders management, social impact, unintended consequences, the cost of the energy transition, mm -hmm. Uh, this gives us a very narrow path, actually, which we have to be very aware of. And, and I, I find sometimes it's even a bigger challenge than the technology. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. Someone once said that, um, I can't remember who this was, but that the energy transition will move at the speed of trust. And there's a lot to be said for that. Ministers? Yeah. In fact, I, I believe that the answer ought to be because the technology plays a very important part. It allows us to solve a techno technological issue but eventually you need to, as I mentioned earlier, we need to move the whole people along. That as, an, as a nation, national government, we need to move our nation and together we need to move the world so that we can come together and uh, to solve, address this problem, not just from a technological point of view, but from a, a conviction point of view, that we believe in it and we must uh, move towards it uh, in a very, very definitive steps. And I, I, I share the optimism with uh, Dan that uh, with uh, uh, COP, COP26, with a collaboration between China and US, it gives us renewed hope that we will be able to move forward in this direction. Minister? So, look, I, um, I'll give a real politician's answer here and say <laughs> that um, I don't think A, B or C quite sum up um, <laughs> what, what we need to do. I, I think it's a mixture, really, of, of B and C. Uh, I, there is no question that, that technology is the key. That, that's, I think, without doubt. But it's how we utilise that technology collectively yes. that ultimately is going to decide whether, whether we get to net zero by 2050 or not. That's, that's going to be, be the key. And that's all, up to all of us. Everyone can play their small part. Um, and if we all do that and technology is able to find, find the path, I'm confident that, that we, can, we can get there. But it, it's going to take collective action and it's going to require all of us leaning into it. But if we do that, I am confident that, that we can get there. I look at what we've done with vaccines through this pandemic. I, I mean, we've done what 10 years ago it, it would have taken five to 10 years to do, develop a vaccine for a coronavirus. And yet we've been able to manage that in the space of 12 12 months. The research and development that is now going into this area um, makes what we're able to put into vaccine development pale into insignificance. And it's technology across the board, um, whether it's trying to capture carbon into soil, which I think has got enormous potential if we can do it right. And we're now starting to see the R&D going to it. Imagine if we didn't subsidise agriculture. Just imagine that for one moment. We stop subsidising agriculture and we put all that money that goes into those subsidies into R&D to improve land use. That would be an extraordinary change. And even if we can do a little bit of that by cutting agricultural subsidies, you send emissions down, and also if you put that money then into R&D, into how you can put more carbon into the soil, that, that, that's a game changer. Now, it's going to take us a little while to get there, but with that sort of innovation and that sort of approach by, by governments, uh, 
I think we can, we can get there. So I can't see one of those absolutely encapsulating where we need to go, but a sort of a mixture of B and C, and I think we get there. Les Jean. My answer is, is D. <laughs> <laughs> you make a good politician. <laughs> <laughs> so knowledge with entrepreneurship and support by government. Mm. So today, business is waiting for government policy change, carbon pricing, culture change. But the government is waiting for us. Mm -hmm. Is how about the technology? Well, as a project, can we get more confidence to modify our policies? So now we need is technology already is there, cost is there, but you need entrepreneurship to drive this with bold vision to take big actions with iconic project. Think about electric vehicle. How can we bring to today? Elon Musk have a such a strong vision and commitment. It was, it was actually five, six years. Now the entire EV sector has have automotive sector have big change. So I think there are a dozen fields have the opportunity with a Tesla. So green hydrogen, synthetic fuel, digitalization for decarbonization, all this play, playground, we need entrepreneurship to drive this momentum to kick off with iconic project. Then everything is going to follow. Excellent. Well. I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists, and I hope we've made you t at least 10% more optimistic about uh, <laughs> <laughs>